So Jim, thanks for coming up. Um, great seeing you again. And thanks for being such a good supporter of Farragut Forward. Um, going back to the 1980s, you met, you developed a rapport and friendship with Robert Fletcher. You then later wrote the book. Can you describe how briefly how that came about? Yeah. Um, thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, so actually, there are two versions of the book. One predates the first time I met Bob Fletcher. And it was based on just looking at photographs and, and, and doing research. And it wasn't terribly accurate. And then I met him at a convention in Atlanta, um, somewhere around the mid 80s, and uh, got to talk with him, got to ask him questions, um, got to wear one of the uniforms, and also inspect uh, the bomber jacket and uh, the excursion jacket, Shatner's excursion jacket. Um, and then after having done that, I mean, once I wore the uniform, it's like, yeah, I really want one of these, and I want it to look perfect. Um, after I did that, then I went back and I modified the book and, uh, and gave it to Majel and said, start selling this version now and not the original version. Um, she had also, at that point, um, previously with the first one, she had uh, combined what I had done with Bob's book of, I think it's called Book of Rank and Uniforms, but his, his notebook. Right, I think it was the construction guide. Yeah, mine was the construction guide. His was uh, rank and, yeah, something like that. Anyway, but, you know, people have probably seen that. Obviously, you have uh, as part of your research, I know. Um, and Bob's book was basically designed to give to the wardrobe people so that they would maintain continuity and he wouldn't have to worry about it anymore because you know, as you know from having talked to him, once he, he created those costumes, the uniforms, Starfleet uniforms, he kind of had moved on in his mind to things like the Klingon uh, uniforms and the uh, Vulcan uniform, or Vulcan uh, costumes. So, but, oh, but uh, yeah, so the second version is the accurate version. And if anybody has a copy out there, I hope it's the second one. From there, you also documented um, and had it ready for publication that people were able to get, which was the enlisted jumpsuit. So a similar guy that gave all the details to the Monster Maroon and its construction, you did the same effort for the enlisted jumpsuit. Right. Um, I had the opportunity, I don't remember how it came about, but I had an opportunity to go to, to a convention and somebody there had one. Now keep in mind, this was before the days of, you know, auctions where costumes were being sold legitimately from Paramount's wardrobe uh, storage. So I don't know how this person came about it, but um, I went ahead and I took pictures and I examined it. Um, and the process was pretty much the same what it was with the second version of the uh, the officer's uniform book. It was just, you know, make taking pictures, documenting things like the the width of the top stitching off the seams and that sort of thing. Um, and it was it was interesting because of course, you know, those uniforms are repurposed from the first movie, the class C's from the first movie. And they did dye tests to see what color would work best on those gray ones and white ones and that's what they ended up with, that, that color. So Bill Tice created the original 1960s uniforms. Then after the motion picture, Robert Fletcher was brought back in, working with Nick Meyer to make these Navy nautical uniforms as a nod to Horatio Hornblower. And then when Bill Tice came back in the fold for Next Gen, another dramatic difference. I think Bill Tice's concepts were very revolutionary in terms of trying to think of something that would be worn from the perspective of 1960 to then you know 200 years forward but I think Bill I think that um, Robert Fletcher brings it home and back to the Navy and the 
Horatio Hornblower, um, your thoughts on all of that. Well, remember the design philosophy is different between the, the two designers in a couple of ways. So Bill Tice is hearkening back to the original series. It, it's really Roddenberry's um, edict that Starfleet's not a military organization, even though they have ranks and military courtesy and all that. But they're not militaristic. And so that's what you have in the original series. You have something that's kind of stripped down, unconstructed. It's, it's, it appears to be simple. It does have rank and, and uh, designation for different uh, functions. And you see a return to that in the next generation. Um, and, and of course, I'm sure that there was influence from Bob Fletcher's stuff done for the first Star Trek feature. Bill Tice's costumes are also costumes. Uh, I think most people, if they ever read any interviews with him, know that to him, what was really important was the way it looked. It suggested another time, uh, a future, something that we hadn't seen before. Um, Bob Fletcher's uh, mandate was different, and starting with Star Trek II. And that was, you know, as you pointed out, Nick Meyer's take was, this is Horatio Hornblower in space, which actually feeds back to Roddenberry's original description of Kirk. Um, and if you've ever seen the Gregory Peck movie, you, you, it's obvious the two characters are two peas in a pod. But Nick Meyer wanted something more dramatic, you know, the monochromatic, uh, uh, very sleek costumes in Star Trek The Motion Picture. That wasn't the movie he wanted to make. And so he kind of harkened back his his visual cue was the prisoner of Zenda. That's, that's what he gave to Bob Fletcher. So Fletcher had a different, uh, he was pointed in a different direction than Bill Tice was. Um, and unlike Tice, you know this from having talked to, to Fletcher, he didn't look at costumes as costumes. And you know, we've discussed the fact that in most of converse, most of the conversations that you would have had with him, he would refer to the costumes as clothes. And if you've ever worn a Bill Tice costume or uniform, and then you've born, uh, worn a uh, Robert Fletcher one, you know, one feels like a costume, which is not to take away from the in ingenuity of it, but the other one feels like clothes. And part of that, Fletcher went back to um, traditional woolens, um, kind of eschewed any kind of synthetics. Uh, part of that was because uh, that's the way uniforms, military uniforms are made, the kind of uniforms that Nick Meyer wanted. But also, they're more structured, but they have to mold better, better to the body. They're not kind of loose clothing like uh, Bill Tice did in the original series. They really are uniforms. They look like uniforms. So those are the, those are the main differences between the two. It's just two des different design philosophies and they were given you know, different marching orders. So for someone like me and growing up in the Cincinnati area in the late 80s, going to some conventions, I think that you've had a contribution to many fans growing up that wanted to have a Mons Maroon uniform and then later a next gen uniform, did not have any access. You saw all these materials close hand, you documented, you, you researched to find where you could get the notions and get the fabrics and you documented and provided that to fans. I think you, you know, I'd like to personally thank you for the contribution that you made both for the Monster Maroon, the enlisted jumpsuit, and then later the season one and two next, next generation jumpsuit. One final remark, I mean, I'd like to hear your take. Um, Jim, you've, you've been a great help, a great supporter of Farragut Forward. You had a lot of insight not only what was, how the, those uniforms were made, you've seen the behind the scenes of the Farragut team. You've seen the uniforms I've made um, as it relates to what we're putting together for Farragut Forward. Anything you'd like to say to our fan base? Well, I mean, I don't sew. I, I, you and, and uh, other few friends that I have taught yourself how to sew, but more than that, to tailor. So I'm, I'm in, in absolute admiration that 
that you can do this sort of thing. And one of the things that, that I admire that you did in the first Farragut series is you're creating costumes that, as, as I was putting it earlier, look like they were stolen from wardrobe. And that's, to me, that's, that's the, uh, the gold standard. And so, I mean, I am aware of, you know, intellectually of the things that go together, not just on the outside of the costumes, but with these, the officers' uniforms, especially with the jackets, what goes on inside the costumes. And I said watching, or as I was saying to you earlier, watching you put these things together, it's incredible. I remember the first time I saw one of your synthetic ones, I was surprised at how well it molded um, because synthetics don't tend to do that. Woolens are much better than that. But, you know, you guys are creating stuff that, as I said, looks like it could have come, come off the soundstage. And that's kind of what I've come to expect from you and from the production. But it's, it's been really a privilege and, and it's been really cool to see how these things just start with bolts of fabric and then you're reproducing exactly what was made, you know, 40 years ago. I mean, it looks, it looks exactly the same. Thank you, Jim. Surely, thank you. Thank you.